Jim is uh, the co-planner and co-organizer of this event and next uh, October 18th, um, uh, Day Zero Neurotechnology. is the director for Center for Neurotechnology Studies at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies in Arlington, uh, professor in the Department of Biochemistry and uh, Integrative uh, Physiology, scholar in residence and head of the Clinical Neuroethics Program at the Center for Clinical Bioethics at Georgetown University Medical Center. Do you ever get tired of setting through your list of credentials? No. No, it's not, because I'm only about a third of the way through. Um, Fulbright Visiting Professor in Neuroscience and Ethics at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, a Research Professor professor in Ethics at the University of New Mexico, a Distinguished uh, Visitor Professor at Gallaudet University, uh, the author of 175 peer-reviewed papers and six books on neuroscience, neuroethics. His ongoing research focuses on the uh, use of neuroscience and neurotechnology and the neuro neuroethical issues arising from neuroscientific research and applications in medicine, public life, and security. Jim, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for helping us uh, with yeah, coordination. Thank you. And thank you all, and thank you for coming. Now, there's two things I want to apologize for right off the bat. First and foremost, this is not a speech impediment, this is a New York accent. And so if for whatever reason you don't understand, just raise a hand. And second, this is about brain science, and this is where I spend the majority of my working day and a lot of my dreaming nights. And if, in fact, I happen to slip into jargon, well, I apologize, but I'll try very hard not to. So what I'd like to talk to you about here is the art and science of brain science. Brain science is rather interesting. I mean, one of the things that we found is that this field, neuroscience, in its titular form, <clears throat> really existing perhaps 35, 40 years, when I got into the field, here I am dating myself, there were only a few programs that were called neural or neurosciences. Now, you really can't swing a wet rope over your head without hitting a, the collegiate level, university level, high school level, and of course, think tanks like the one I belong to that are dedicated to brain science and its myriad effects in public life, medicine, and a host of variety of, of other different venues that we'll talk about. But I think what's important to note is that this probing into the brain has addressed long-standing, predorable, philosophical questions. What does it mean to be? What is the nature of consciousness? How much brain does one need to have mind? Does every brain instantiate a mind? And if you change the brain, do you change the mind? Do animals have minds? And increasingly, as we moved into the Industrial Revolution and the machine, post-machine age, could we perhaps make something that has sufficient of enough hardware, if you will, to generate the software of a mind? But increasingly, what we found is that the art in this science, as we can see here before us, has progressed in the span of a century and a few other years to go from artistic representations that were post-mortem and anatomical to being able to harness technology to gain new theories that allow us to then peer into the living brain, not just to assess, but also to access and increasingly to target. Indeed, what we found is that the heuristics of neuroscience engage a number of tools to develop new theories. And from those theories, tentative as they may be, we then develop new tools with which to gain insight, influence, and manipulation. Now, what is it really that we can do in neuroscience? Well, this is what neuroscience brings us. This is the area that I devote much of my career to called neuroscience and technology, or more colloquially, neuro s &T. Indeed, engaging the tasks and techniques of neuroscience has been reliant, if not wholly in part, about various techniques and technologies that we borrowed from other disciplines, developed anew, not just mechanical technologies, although certainly, but also tools and techniques increasingly from a broader and more consilient range of the sciences. We cracked open some of those silos of academia. Neuroscience is no longer just anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, but ever more is becoming involved with physics on a grand and small scale, computational engineering and sciences, philosophy, anthropology, ethics, religion. But if we just ground these to the idea of utilizing our techniques and our technologies, what then can we do? Well, I have before you 
the current palette of at least the basic neuroscience and technological capabilities. Well, if you look at these, we find that there are two major groupings. The assessment technologies, things as neuroimaging, neurogenomics, and neurogenetics that engage the neurogenome and individual genetics to predict perhaps what might be, what could be. We also find neuroproteomics that utilize a variety of central and peripheral biomarkers to try to get a feeling of what's going on in this sort of proverbial black box of the brain, in the living organism, and then utilize these as identifiable targets to then harness these interventional neuroscientific and neurotechnological tools. If we take a look at these, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is better living through chemistry. In many ways, it's brave new brain chemistry that allows us to go beyond simple constraints of human performance, cognition, capability, to reverse some of those aspects of the human predicament that have beguiled philosophy and society since almost time immemorial, pain, suffering, sadness, angst, to probe new depths of relationality by understanding tentative substrates that exist in the brain and its functions mind. But we've gone beyond that as well. The brain is now a viable target for us in terms of our capability to get in there, as we see here an indwelling brain device. And we can use the engineering that is at our capability and literally our fingertips to now create engineering and technology that is at our synaptotips. Oh, in so many ways, the cyborg prophecies that were advocated in the early 1960s by Klein and Kleins, increasingly being realized at the interface of what brain science can do. But of course, we must ask also, what are these things really doing? When we put a brain implant into the brain, when in fact we engage new pharmaceuticals, when we utilize neuroimaging, you can't go anywhere these days without seeing a wonderful picture like this. This is your brain on drugs. This is your brain in love. This is your brain looking at bourbon. <laughs> we know that in fact there's great science that goes along with that. But I can tell you from my own experience as a laboratory scientist, that there's also a considerable amount of artistic flair. We set the thresholds. We determine the horizontal, the vertical, for those of you who are old enough to remember the outer limits. These are the new inner limits to which we're then providing outer boundaries. And in fact, there's great capability that can come from the use of this science and these technologies. Oh, indeed, it allows us ever more prescience, ever greater capability to probe what we know and do so in the spirit philosophy of science, to be self-critical and self-revisionist. I stand before you and what I tell you is that neuroscientific knowledge has about a five-year window of capability. What I learned in much of my graduate education is wrong. It required revision. But it's not just a simple fact here or a simple fact there. No, no, not at all. With each new domino that we then turn over, the entirety of those dominoes may topple and whole constructs of what we know about the way brains can, in fact, instantiate minds, selves, others, relationality change. Yet, yet, we probe on with these technologies. And we rely on them, poised precipitously at the interface between what we know, what we don't, and perhaps what may be unknowable, and yet what we may not know that we don't know. Oh, the technological imperative is huge. And in our next month's session, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ethical, legal, and social implications and responsibilities that go along with that. But how then do we use the brain sciences? How do we engage these tools and technologies and techniques in the social sphere? Because neuroscience isn't something esoteric. Neuroscience is a human endeavor employed in the milieu of human endeavor. It is richly embedded within the fabric of our socio-culture. The first and foremost area that comes to mind is that these tools are, in fact, research tools that allow us ever more advanced knowledge to then create new and revised theories from which to then base a host of epistemological characteristics and trajectories about what we are, who we may be, and what these relationships between we as a species mean and other species may mean, and, of course, what we may create in the interim. And also, the strong driver is characteristically always beneficent. We're looking to flourish. We're looking to thrive. We're looking to reverse, overcome, and mitigate the ills and sorrows of the human condition and the human predicament. And of course, that's focused 
to the point of the pencil that we call medicine, the art and science of healing, curing, caring. And brain science, without doubt, very defensively, has offered great opportunities to be able to reduce the burdens of signs and symptoms of a host of neurological and psychiatric disorders, and in some cases, perhaps, reverse, cure, and prevent others. But remember that we, too, based upon our tools and theories, set the threshold of what constitutes a disorder. Neuroscience allows us also to take this into the public sphere in a much more ontological way. What represents the new normal of neuroscience? What represents what is good, bad, right, wrong? One of the fields we'll talk about next week is a field that I spend much of my time with is neuroethics. And in one of its traditional applications, it is, in fact, the brain science of our morality and ethics. Is this a new meta-ethics that allows us to determine how brains calculate what is good, bad, right, wrong for our societies and others? And how will we use that? Oh, indeed, using neuroscience in medicine is a great bridge to overcome human frailty. Using it in public life may be a wonderful tool, perhaps digging a tunnel through the bedrock of our own capability to expand what we are biologically, cognitively, emotionally, socially, perhaps even spiritually. It may provide these bridges between our cultures and others as it indicates the material basis, at least at some point, of our anthropological constants and our anthropological variances and lets us appreciate that there may be more to mind than just nerve. Uh, indeed, one of the things that contemporary neuroscience postures, and I agree with, is that in fact you have a brain, but you are a mind. But let's not forget that brains and minds are embodied and embedded in culture, and culture comes along with all the capriciousness that exists within the social sphere. And like any form of science and technology, it is bivalent. It is the face of Janus. It offers for us both the cyborg prophecies of increasingly fusing with our technology in ways that are irrevocable towards things that may represent utopian aspirations of what we may become, but also dystopian anxieties of what we can do with this stuff. One whole area where I spend much of my time is on the proverbial dark side, dealing with this field of weaponizable neuroscience. How might contemporary culture harness these tools and techniques both to develop frank weapons in the strictest sense or perhaps leverage the power that neuroscience and technology renders on the economic world stage to upset the balance of financial markets and power and in that way engage what the philosopher Michel Foucault referred to as biopower and when rendered both by individuals and groups a form of biopolitics. Is the next war going to be on the neural frontier? As my colleague Jonathan Moreno argues, a war of minds. Will we have the prescience? Will we have the fortitude to be able to map ourselves forward, to use these in ways that are not only good by our own definition, but that allow us to reach out beyond our borders of society and culture to determine a broader good or not? One thing I can tell you almost without doubt is what neuroscience is doing is doing and will continue to do is what you see before you. It is a tool of change agency that allows us to certainly address, identify, and change aspects of the human predicament, pain, suffering, sadness, perhaps the limits and boundaries of what it is that we are and define ourselves to be. It allows us perhaps to change human relationships, to bridge these gaps between self and others through the cyborg prophecies by brain, mind, and brain computer interfacing that allow some seamless forms of communication between me and you so that those boundaries become arbitrary evermore. It allows us perhaps also to develop distinct relationships between what it means to be me and what it means to be you and allows me to reach across those boundaries in a way that is both communicative and in some cases distributive so that our moral treatment and regard is based upon particular criteria where we recognize that those things that have the hardware of a brain to create the software of a mind should be the subjects of our moral regard and our ethical legal treatment of being just. But also neuroscience and neurotechnology holds potential to change 
human beings end in that way what it means to be human. These are the cyborg prophecies embodied because, as I mentioned, neuroscience cracks those traditional silos of unitary disciplines and brings together as the lead in its pencil genetics, nanoscience, cyber science, a host of the traditional physical and natural sciences and ever more the social sciences and the humanities. And in so doing, literally, we put our head into the center of the world that we know and our world becomes ever more centered on what we know about what exists in our head. Whether right or wrong, neuroscience seems to portend a cultural shift for a new global reality that allows us to look at ourselves through both a lens of science and a mirror of reflection. And indeed, with such knowledge comes great power. With great power comes tremendous responsibility. We argue, indeed, what we'll learn from neuroscience is that we are rational, moral animals. But even though we may leverage neuroscience as the big stick that allows us to peer into or pry beneath those rocks that may obscure our power of reason, and we move ever more to try to understand these neurological bases of how we intuit, how we know, how we reason, we must also ask, will we then gain a deeper set of rationality for the ways we study neuroscience, use neuroscience, and misuse it. I'm very, very fond of Goethe's somewhat morality play, Faust. And I think in many ways, Faust could be the mantra for contemporary neuroscience. Indeed, Faust, Dr. Faustus, a knowledge person, one who embraces knowledge and wisdom for treating the human condition. Recall, Faust was a physician, craves ever more as he comes to the twilight of his career, not just simply knowledge in its own sake, science qua scientia, but science to be able to leverage power in society, politics, and in love. And of course, in so doing, as you know the story, he makes a pact with the devil. But that's actually a running bet between the deity who Goethe calls God and the devil and Satan. And Satan sends his agent, Mephistopheles, and says, I will tempt this learned man who you have created. And the deity God says, no, you can't, my friend, because what I have given him is reason. And as such, anything you tempt him with, the unbridled capability of knowledge, power, he will refute because he cannot handle it. To which a classic line, Mephistopheles laughs, looks at God and says, es nennt vernunft und braucht allein. Man needs only this thing he calls reason to succumb to be more beastly than any beast. The question, ladies and gentlemen, is that which was evoked by Goethe's Faust. How will we use the reason and rationality of our neuroscientific research tools and its tasks? In very many ways, this thing that we put before us and hold in our hands this brain mind that we study as a focus of our inquiry and our insight and our self-reflection is in our hands. It is up to us what we do with it. Hopefully, we shan't fumble in it. Thank you.